Hi there, Wednesday evening Bible study at Friendship Wesleyan Church, um, 7 p.m. on Wednesdays, online and in-house. And of course, this is our online version of our Wednesday night Bible study. Thank you for joining with me tonight. If I haven't said it yet, today is November 2nd, and we've been talking about that for quite some time. And here's the reason why. About eight weeks I've been saying that. Um, November 2nd would be the final lesson in our first and second Peter Bible study. And so tonight is our, our final evening. Next week, we begin a study in the book of Joshua, a, a historical book. And we've been, I've mentioned that to you, I think I even did last week, that I'm excited about going back to the Old Testament, going to historical books, a genre of the Bible. I love the history books in the Bible, the history that's in the Bible. There's history in oh, in some form or another in all the books, but the historical books, we finished up Exodus, um, the Bible study before First and Second Peter, and so it's kind of a natural thing to go into Joshua, and so I'm excited about that. Our reading plan is online uh, well, uh, at .org com. the left-hand tab at the top, drop down, I think it says ministry opportunities, something like that, Wednesday Night Bible Study, and you can find the reading plan, old reading plans, and our study material. So tonight we're in chapter three of Second Peter, chapter three of Second Peter, and like I've already said, uh, it's been a good journey, and um, we're going to uh, do uh, finish our final thoughts in uh, this book of the Bible. So let me begin with a word of prayer. Father, we're grateful tonight to have the breath of life in us. Your word tells us that everything that has breath should praise you. We're here to praise, Father. Um, we're here to uh, walk in your word, to know you better, and uh, to have you speak to us through your word, Father. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with you, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us. So, Father, uh, Jesus is the word, our Savior, and we're grateful tonight that while we were still sinners, you you loved us and sent Jesus to die for our sins, um, that if we would receive your free gift, Father, then we would walk in a relationship with you and into eternal life. So guide and direct us tonight in your word. These hearts filled with gratitude want to know you better. We pray all this in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. Okay, so um, chapter three, the final chapter of Second Peter, and I want to begin reading. I'm going to read a couple of verses and pause for some commentary. Hopefully we'll finish through verse seven fairly quickly, though. So, dear friends, this is now my second letter to you, uh, first and second Peter. I have written both of them as reminders to stimulate to you to wholesome thinking. Uh, there's a key verse, right? I didn't, didn't intend to pause here, but there's a key verse that both letters were written to stimulate them to wholesome thinking. I did a word study because I was like, okay, if that's the purpose of these letters, what is wholesome thinking? What was the point of that? Um, and I didn't, when I did the word study, I didn't, I didn't insert that in here, but it, it, uh, you will notice if you do your word study that some translations use the word pure or sincere thinking, um, but it's a Greek word that means to be revealed, to have all the light shed on, um, and, uh, our, our thinking totally revealed and in the truth, wholesome thinking. I want you to recall the words spoken in the past by the holy prophets and the command given by our Lord and Savior through your apostles. So I want to pause, wanted to pause here, verse two in particular. Remember that Peter um, has dealt with the negative influences of false teachers. And we dealt with that last week. It actually began over in chapter one, but was named in chapter two. Um, so, so he's been dealing with that. Now, in verse two, he's 
making a positive declaration of what they should be listening to. What does he say in verse two? I want you to recall the words spoken in the past by the Holy Prophets. Listen to the Old Testament prophets, right? Because maybe they were asking, okay, how do we know what teacher, you know, how do we know uh, who we should listen to? So listen to the Old Testament prophets, the scriptures for you and I, uh, the Bible, and the command given by our Lord and Savior through your apostles. So listen to the apostles. And once again, for you and me, that ends up being the Old and New Testaments um, uh, that, that we have. But it's positive declaration about who uh, you should be listening to. Verse three, above all, you must understand that in the last days, scoffers will come, scoffing and following their own evil desires. They will say, where is this coming, he promised. Ever since our ancestors died, everything goes on as it has since the beginning of creation. But they deliberately forget that long ago, by God's word, the heavens came into being and the earth was formed out of water and by water. By these waters, also the world of the time was deluged and destroyed. By the same word, the present heavens and earth are reserved for fire, being kept for the day of judgment and destruction of the ungodly. So last week, if I remember correctly, I read that much of the text to show you that <clears throat> Peter was speaking in, was making objections to, uh, remember our timeline? <coughs> Excuse me. Peter was making objections. Here's, if you're looking at the timeline, we're going to finish it up now over here. But uh, objection uh, one, we I pointed this out uh, to you uh, last week. <clears throat> but objection one, that Peter had made up stories. So uh, Peter was objecting to the accusation that the stories were false. He'd seen in person at the transfiguration <clears throat> and the prophets had given the scripture and Jesus was in the Old Testament prophecies. Then here's objection to Peter's objecting to um, their teaching, their thinking <clears throat> that there was no final reckoning no final judgment. And that had led them to greedily taking money from the church while living in sexual immorality. And that, that's objection two. We went over this, like I said last week, <clears throat> the reason I'm saying all that is because we're going to deal mainly with objection three uh, this evening. The verses in the text you're probably familiar with, if not, they're very popular verses. But all of this is Peter's objection to, and he's objecting to the reasoning behind their thinking that there wouldn't be a judgment or a final, final reckoning. And what was it that they were saying in verse four? They were saying, He's not going to come back. Everything goes on the way that it has. His promise to return hasn't happened. And so Peter's going to lean into that and make an objection. Much of what we just read is his objection uh, to that. So I wanted to make note of a couple of things. First of all, <clears throat> in verse three, you must understand that in these last days, and I want you to understand that that phrase, these last days, is referring to the time from Christ's first appearance to the culmination of the ages or his second coming, um, the end times or the last days. So you, you, see, um, you see that, as a matter of fact, it can be a little confusing uh, that in the last days, and you and I are thinking, um, Peter clearly believed that they were in the last days, right? Now, don't be one of those who hears that. Well, it's been 2,000 years, and Peter thinks that that will be these people in these texts if we're not if we're not careful, right? Um, so, um, so the last days were are that considered that period of time. Um, and what I just referred to, like, if I say that and you're thinking, well, it's been 2000 years. So that's where verse eight comes in. Right. Um, 
verse eight, but do not forget this one thing. Many of you have heard this, maybe even have it memorized, dear friends. With the Lord, a day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years are like a day. So in that case, from the first advent of Christ, it's been two days, right? <laughs> Excuse me, it's been so it's been two days. So it's it's when you're looking at it that way. <clears throat> I don't think Peter was actually trying to make a case that way, but we'll get to that in uh, in in just a moment. And by the way, that verse, uh, verse eight, um, clearly is uh, a most agree that uh, Peter was thinking of and nearly quoting, not exactly Psalm 90, verse four, a thousand years in your sight are like a day that has just gone by or like a watch in the night. No, <clears throat> I kind of agree with the scholars that say there's there's really no internal proof, but Peter would have known that psalm and clearly is uh, referring, and most of your study Bibles have a footnote and uh, and will give you uh, that psalm. So this verse, uh, verse 8, that I don't have on the screen for you. <clears throat> There's been a lot of discussion and debate about that verse. So I wanted to pause there for a moment. Um, do not forget this one thing, dear friends, with the Lord a day is like a thousand years, a thousand years is are like a day. <clears throat> um, and when I say a lot of discussion and debate, it falls into that whole uh, category of study called biblical numerology. Um, some of you probably heard of that. You know what I'm referring to. Um, for example, in the Bible, the number seven is used a lot, the number 40. So it's the study of numbers in the Bible. Matter of fact, I think I have a slide here <clears throat> that with, a, with a type of definition, numerology. Biblical numerology is the study of individual numbers in scriptures. It relates particularly to the biblical meaning of numbers, both literal and symbolic. So it's obvious that some of the numbers in the Bible are symbolic, metaphorical. Um, and so it's the study of all of those things. And this verse gets shoved in there in some context. Matter of fact, I didn't even intend, I'm not going to tonight to try to show you, for example, how that text fits in there. And <clears throat> well, here's a thought. Um, some people will go to like Gen Genesis numbers, the creation and the, the six days of creation. And they'll use this text to say that that text doesn't mean seven literal days, six days of creation, one day of rest. And so that's how it gets put into number context in the, the scriptures. If I didn't say it, um, they do that to show that it couldn't have been seven little days because for God, a day is like a thousand years. Maybe it was 7,000 years. And so, so it, it ends up in conversations like that. But we've got to use caution here. Here's some of my thinking. We love a good mystery. I've said that. And there's lots of mystery to the Bible. I'm not denying that. And I love the mysteries too. <clears throat> Um, but it's one of those things, again, where our love for a mystery can easily cause us to miss the point. And you don't want to miss the point. The point of the scripture is the point. The point's not the mystery. We go looking for mysteries a lot of times like that's the point. <clears throat> um, even a good mystery. Numerology, by the way, uh, numerology has often digressed and I'm not going to give you examples of this tonight, but has digressed to uh, divination and the occult. And so, um, <clears throat> so you take that whole thing and the mystery of numbers and stuff ends up in, in um, the occult and the, the divining outside um, the context of scripture and and uh, and so it's in that light that I say we really have to be careful for for following mysteries over the point. Um, we want to make sure that we get the point. So this text is pretty easy, really. To, it's an obvious point, right? 
And the point is what? I mean, it's obvious that uh, God is not contained by our time limits. Remember, uh, the skeptics were, uh, were accusing, making these accusations. Peter's responding to that. They're saying there's not going to be a judgment. Um, and then the their reasoning behind that, his objection he's responding to now is, hey, it, the Lord has the, the, this promise of all this stuff, and he said he'd come back, and, and uh, we can go all the way back to the earliest uh, recorded time, and everything's gone on the way that it has. And, and, uh, and so... You know, Peter's response one day is a thousand years, a thousand years are one like one day is a simple statement of God is not constrained by our time limits. Delay is our issue, not uh, God's, because that was the act, the that was the, um, you know, the 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 Lord was delayed in coming uh, according to human beings, but not according to God's timing. His timing is perfect. And remember the context, uh, these people are thinking a delay in is in the judgment. It's not going to happen. There won't be. And Peter's saying, there will be. It's in God's timing, not yours. And I love verse nine that gives context. You can't do verse eight without verse nine, right? So a day, a day are like, uh, uh, a day is like a thousand years and a thousand years are like a day. Listen to verse nine. The Lord is not slow in keeping his promise as some understand slowness. Instead, he is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. So then Peter um, adds on the reasoning behind God's timing that we might consider delay, but his timing is perfect. And it's mercy and patience, right? He, he's, he doesn't want anybody to perish. And he's being patient. So then uh, let's read uh, verse 10, another verse that has a lot of study discussion surrounding it. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief. The heavens will disappear with a roar. The elements will be destroyed by fire. The earth and everything done in it will be laid bare. And this fits into... Peter's letting them know a judgment is going to happen, right? Remember that? This is getting too repetitious, maybe. A lot of study done on this text, this verse 10. It fits into that category of apocalyptic literature. It's one of those things. There's still enough mystery about the apocalyptic, the end times, what's going to happen in the culmination of the ages, the end of times, the return of Christ, the judgment, the... Um, rapture, um, all of these things are fit into apocalyptic um, literature. And we would really like to know its future, right? So we want to know what's going to happen. It, it creates this mystery where we go, once again, you know, looking uh, to, to try to reveal what seems to be mysterious to us. But this verse 10, matter of fact, I took my study Bible and uh, took a picture of the footnote, the commentary, so you'll see that I'm not, I'm not off track too far here. It's at three ten, the day of the Lord. It's speaking in particular. I'll get to that in a moment. The day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. But uh, uh, apocalyptic language: the heavens will disappear with a roar. So those italicized, like a thief, are what's in the text. And then the explanation is it's apocalyptic language in times common to books like Daniel and Revelation. And uh, and so <clears throat> and you could you you may have a study Bible and probably have the exact same footnote. But my point here is this one piece of text fits into in times apocalyptic uh, literature. So the day of the Lord is used a lot in the Bible. So verse 10, but the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. And I want to just touch on that for a moment. It's it's used a lot in the Bible, actually. Um, and of course, between translations, it's going to be a little bit different as to how it's used. So I would say this, and I got this short list. It's not comprehensive, meaning it doesn't have all of 
the potential scriptures that referred to a day of the Lord or the day of the Lord. And like I said, that in different ways it's used. Um, so this isn't a complete list, but just the Old Testament, you can see the various references here that include some allusion, uh, some words that mean the day of the Lord. And then in the New Testament um, as well, we have our Second Peter 3.10 right here, um, the day of the Lord, and then also in Revelation. So it's very, uh, very commonly used phrase of uh, for what? <laughs> the day of the Lord. Remember I said this is end times, apocalyptic. The day of the Lord in the New Testament refers to a still future fulfillment. That's what we believe, that it's yet to come. That's why I say there's a mystery for us. When God's wrath is poured out on unbelieving Israel and on the unbelieving world. The final outcome of the day of the Lord will be that, and this is from Isaiah 2.17, the arrogance of man will be brought low and the pride of men humbled. The Lord alone will be exalted in that day. There, there's a reference actually to the day of the Lord. The ultimate or final fulfillment of the prophecies concerning the day of the Lord will come at the end of history when God with wondrous power will punish evil and fulfill all his promises. Um, another quote or text that I got from, um, I thought it put it very well, uh, gotquestions.org. Uh, so you probably noticed that that day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. That's not uncommon either. Matter of fact, <coughs> excuse me, I may... I may refer to it later, but uh, in 1 Thessalonians, um, Paul uses that same phrase. Jesus, in Luke chapter 12, verse 39, used the same description. It'll be like a thief. And uh, which means what? Sudden and expected. Didn't really need to do a, a word study there. Come like a thief means it'll be when people aren't expecting, when they're saying, oh, he'll, he'll never come back, right? <clears throat> so... There's a significant contradiction in the translation of this verse, the end part of it anyway, that has brought much speculation, a lot of debate and discussion. And it deals around what's going to happen to the physical world as we know it, because um, uh, hopefully I read that entire verse for you, but let me read it again so you'll see what I'm saying, verse 10. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief. The heavens will disappear with a roar. The elements will be destroyed by fire. That's where maybe even you, but a lot of people, oh, it's going to all be destroyed by fire in the end of days. And the earth and everything done in it will be laid bare. And then that's where some contradictions come in. I just threw up a few translations for you, um, probably the three most common um, that I'm aware of. Uh, so what I read to you from the NIV and the earth and everything done, it will be laid bare. Um, the ESV and the earth and the works that are done on it will be exposed and then the King James Version is significant and probably where I think a lot of people get there, it's going to be burned up. The earth also and the works that are therein shall be burned up. So um, so here's the deal, because I, I read that from the King James. I'm like, so is this, and, and we can get it from a previous text. As a matter of fact, if you look I think the King James translate this because I'll show you in a minute, but the word in that end of verse 10, a burned up is not in there in the Greek, but verse seven, did you catch that when we read it? By the same word, so jump back up to verse seven, by the same word, the present heavens and earth are reserved for fire, being kept for the day of judgment and destruction of the ungodly. And then look at verse uh, 12. As you look forward to the day of God and speed, it's coming. That day will bring about the destructions of the heavens by fire. And the elements will melt in the heat. So those two verses, and then you get down to trying to translate 
a word that's very complicated to translate in Greek. And King James chose to just say that it was burned up. Um, when actually the, um, and a lot of translations actually say burned up, but there, there are many that don't also. But uh, let me show you here the Greek word. So I want to show you, I've showed you this before. If you're new to this, um, this is the English, the way it might appear, because this is the Greek words in order and then the way it might appear. And it, it won't sound in our sentence order, but, and the earth and the in it works not be found. So the King James burned up the, uh, the NIV laid bare, uh, whatever translation is this 2147. And it, so if you go to the Greek definition to learn to discover, especially after searching. <laughs> but so come down here to the, the uh, a, a more defined definition of this particular use in 2 Peter 3.10. Shall, shall be found namely for discussion will be unable to hide themselves from the doom decreed them by God. And then that's where you get this will be found. And these other translations will be laid bare, will be exposed as a matter of fact, and the earth and the works that are done on it everything done in it, the works that are therein, they're not going to be destroyed by fire. So I think the King James translation, with what little I know, is not the best, but um, they are going to be exposed and for everyone to see. So now you might go back to 7 and 12 and say, yeah, but everything's going to be burned up that that's that's some of the debate some of the mystery and if you want to follow that mystery down and study it you go right ahead um i uh i didn't for tonight's sake you know run through all of that um with us tonight but here's some things i want to add on if i can here's the deal because um once again, there's that debate. Is everything going to be burned up? What does this text mean when you put it all together? We can debate all day about the physical destruction in this text, but that wasn't the point either, right? Necessarily, it wasn't the point. Um, I'm not opposed to studying it further, but the point was that was the destruction of evil and the ungodly. A matter of fact, verse 7 if you read the entirety of that verse, by the same word, the present heavens and earth are reserved for fire, being kept for the day of judgment and destruction of the ungodly. Um, if there weren't any ungodly, why destroy it? <laughs> uh, you see what I'm saying? The point and the purpose and the direction we're looking at is the evil that's going to be exposed. Um, and mainly we're talking about us human beings who are prone to sin and to uh, evil. And of course, remember Peter speaking into false messages and, uh, and speaking clearly uh, about that. And so the, the, the destruction of ungodly, evil, all of that is undoubtedly the main point of this, uh, of this text. Um, and that's why I think this is important. Evil and sin will be exposed. Um, and by the way, most scholars, if you do your deeper digging into this mystery as to what is everything going to be destroyed by fire, most scholars, I did do some digging, most scholars seem to think that the earth will not be completely destroyed, but just a surface burn. So if you go back and look at the text, you'll be able to see that kind of is in there, that that there's going to be heat and destruction, but won't totally uh, destroy the physical world. And I'm not saying, I didn't do enough work to say my position is this, but I'm just, I did enough reading to know that most of them kind of leaned into that. And um, so the most important point in the text though, I think is what comes next. Not all of this other stuff. This other stuff is speaking into the skeptics and the false teachings and all of that. Now, Peter is going to, and I put it several ways here, 
um, Peter is going to give uh, the church instructions now. In light of this, matter of fact, here's what I have here. Watch for the key words, the key phrases, and the key instructions. I'll try to point them out as I read them uh, for you. So verse 11, we've got what I call a key word right away. Since everything will be destroyed in this way, what kind of people ought you to be? Here comes an instruction. You ought to live holy and godly lives as you look forward to, that's a key phrase, by the way. Notice how many times look forward to is said here. As you look forward to the day of God and speed its coming. Another way to use the day of the Lord, day of God. That day will bring about the destruction of the heavens by fire. The elements will melt in the heat. But in keeping with his promises, we are looking forward to a new heaven and a new earth where righteousness dwells. So then, there you go. There's a key transition, key word, key phrase, if you will. Um, <clears throat> key, uh, what, let me make sure what I, uh, key words, uh, I, that falls in the key words. So then, dear friends, since you are looking forward to this, another key phrase, make every effort to be found. Here comes the instruction. Spotless, blameless, and at peace with him, bear in mind that our Lord's patience means salvation, just as our dear brother Paul also wrote you with the wisdom that God gave him. Wow, we could go into that, Peter and Paul, and Peter's referring to Paul here, but I'm I'm not even going to make it that far because I'm going to work with the key words, key phrases, and key instructions real quick for us to land the uh, plane uh, this this evening. So the key words, I pointed them out to you in verse 11, call them transition words, since and so. Um, in the NIV, it says so then, but since and so, they're, they're transitions, right? Almost like the therefores that we that we have uh, that we have studied. Um, the key phrases I mentioned to you, if you look at verse 12, as you look forward to the day of God, the speed is coming. By the way, he's been talking about all this terrible stuff. I got to point something out to you here. So he's referring to the elements being burned and evil being exposed and all this stuff. But then he's saying to the church people, by the way, this, this, this instruction section is for his readers, the church people, if you will, um, uh, the people he's writing to. And, um, and he, um, and he says to them, as you look forward to what appears to be some really terrible stuff. So, and I want to lean into that a minute. Let me see if I, um, if I had my thought here. Yeah. Yeah, I think I do. We're looking for no. Let's look at all three of the we are the looking forward to. So verse twelve, as you look forward to the day of God and speed its coming. Verse thirteen, but in keeping with His promises, we are looking forward to. Here's a good thing: new heaven and new earth, where righteousness dwells, and that deserves an amen, right? So then, here's another one key phrase, dear friends. Since you are looking forward to this. Um, everything that preceded it, the new and the new earth and righteousness dwells, make every effort to be found spotless, blameless, and at peace um, with him. And so um, what I wanted to point out to you, this all reminded me, because what, what I was trying to say is, so Peter says, look forward to, and really, especially the first one, he's talking about terrible stuff. So how do we look forward to that? Well, the Apostle Paul in 1 Thessalonians, I told you I might come back to that. So in 1 Thessalonians, in between a description of the rapture in chapter 4 and the day of the Lord in chapter 5, so um, uh, in times apocalyptic stuff, um, Paul says, encourage one another with these words. And here's what I simply say to you is, it's clear when you go to any of these texts and you really put it into the whole biblical narrative, the the end times, the judgment, uh, the rapture, the second coming of Christ was not supposed to be a negative, fearful thing for followers of Christ at all. Um, and, and Paul even tells his readers to encourage one another 
with those words and with the thoughts and with the ideas. Of course, Peter inserts some cool stuff here about a new heaven and a new earth. So the end times is not bad news for the believers. It was supposed to bring encouragement. And I'd say the only bad thing that we need to keep in mind is when the judgment comes, there will be people that we love and care for who have not given their lives to Christ. Um, and that is concerning. That's why right now we need to be living for Jesus and learning uh, from the Lord as much as we can and walking close to him so that the world will know, right? And uh, so, okay, key instructions. And I want to finish with this. Uh, I pointed out two places where I think he gives key. Okay, since all this is going to happen, and I think this is the big point here. Um, we can go back and dig on the mysteries, but here's the point. Okay, he's writing to these people and he says to them, um, what kind of, in verse 11, what kind of people ought you to be? You ought to live holy and godly lives. And that's the first instruction. Um, I didn't do a lot of word study here. I'll tell you what I did do. I did um, you, uh, grab the amplified uh, version, which I don't use a lot, but um, of, and I think this will help you to, especially holy behavior, um, will help us to understand. And then I did a little word study on 14, but since all these things are be destroyed in this way, and I underlined the key word, what kind of people ought you to be in holy behavior? That is in a pattern of daily life that sets you apart as a believer and in godliness, displaying profound reverence toward our awesome God. And so living the Christian life and worshiping daily God, that's what Peter wanted for his people. And then verse 14, he gives the second set of instructions. And here's what I did. There were three words in the, in the NIV there, at verse 14, if you're looking at it. Make every effort to be found spotless, blameless, and at peace. When I looked at the Greek definitions, I wasn't going to throw them out there for you, but I thought, no, I, I, I put all three of them up on one screen, okay, from verse 14. Spotless, free from censure, irreproachable, not needing to be cens censored because irreproachable in living and life, free from vice. Um, I didn't go to the English definition, but addictions and um, and habits in our life um, that, you know, are destructive, free from vice, unsullied, blameless, without blame or fault, unblemished. And the NIV said, at peace with him. I just threw the word peace on here. But listen to this definition. The tranquil state of a soul assured of its salvation through Christ. And so fearing nothing from God, no fear. Say that with me, no fear. And content with its earthly lot of whatsoever sort that is. Now, so in light of that, I put the amplified version of this phrase up here also. I thought it was very appropriate. Um, so then, I threw the then in there because that's what we read in the NIV. Beloved, since you are looking forward to these things, new heaven, new earth, everything, the end of the ages, dwell in righteousness. Um, since you are looking forward to these things, be diligent. Here's how we should live now in the tough times. Be diligent and make every effort to be found by him at his return, spotless, blameless, in peace. That is inwardly calm with a sense of spiritual well-being and confidence, having lived a life of obedience to him. Man, that, that, that says it pretty much in one mouthful, right? A calm inner assurance that God's in control, it's all okay, and that I'm growing and living and walking with Jesus. Pretty powerful stuff. Matter of fact, I kind of decided that's a pretty good place to for us to end this evening, to land the plane. I had one more little phrase here. So it made me think, so if we're not inwardly calm right now, how will we be 
in the culmination of the ages, in the unfolding of the last days. Mm, something to think about. Let me pray. Father, thank you for the power of your word. It's been a joy to be in it this evening, for you to teach us, Lord, for you to speak to us. And uh, for each one of us, a little, little different, Father, online, for us to be able to challenge each other. But I feel like spiritually we have, Father, simply by gathering together. Um, may all of us, knowing that we live in the day of the Lord right now, from the first coming of Jesus till the second coming, and we're in the middle of that, Lord, uh, probably closer to the end of that, how should we live? And then take Peter's words, your word, Father, to heart, to live in a growing, vital relationship with you through your son, Jesus, um, to not be fearful, um, but to live in the knowledge of um, salvation and eternal life um, in Jesus and to, li to live the Christian walk each and every day, Father, which the evil one tries to keep us from doing. But we recommit today to living the Christian life with you and for you, Father God. And, and we just ask that you would lead us to people, the ones close to us that we love, and then people we don't know, Father, who need the hope of Jesus Christ. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, so one more final slide for you. Joshua 1, 1 through 8, next week, start a new book of the Bible. Reading plan is online at friendshipwesson.com. Okay, God bless. Have a God week.